Welcome back to Cardinities.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, You Can't Handle the Truth. In this video, we are going to be continuing looking at type-free truth. Here we'll be looking at the Kripke-Pfefferman axiomatic type-free theory of truth. Now, this video is part of a larger series on theories of truth that we haven't done for a while, but we are trying to start back up again. If you have not watched those other videos, or at least the ones starting with Tarski's theory of truth, or you don't have a background in philosophical theories of truth, you may struggle to understand this video. It's going to be one of the more difficult videos that we've done. You are highly encouraged, though, to go back and watch that series from the beginning, and that should give you a solid basis in order to understand the concepts we're going to cover here. If you've already watched that series, or you feel you have a good grasp on philosophical theories of truth, follow me and let's get started. So, first we're going to break down the three parts of the title of this video and the title of this theory. It is, one, a type-free theory, it's an axiomatic theory of truth, and it's offered by Kripke and Pfefferman. First, what is a type Free theory of truth, or what is type free truth? So, to understand that, we have to understand what typed truth is. So, typed truth restricts what our truth predicates can predicate over in the hopes of resolving the liar's paradox. This is what Tarski did. We had different types of truth. We had truth zero, truth one, truth two, and so on. Truth one, could predicate over truth zero, but not itself or anything higher. Truth zero could just predicate over statements that don't have truth in them, and so on and so forth. Basically, you can't say a statement that contains the word truth is true, or at least the same kind of truth. You need to go up in type. Type-free theories, on the other hand, do not restrict what truth can predicate over. They allow for a particular truth predicate to have scope over itself. However, in order to avoid the liar's paradox, we'll need to put new restrictions on truth. Beyond limiting the scope of our general rule regarding disquotation or deflation, we're going to need to restrict one of our other axioms. Which axiom are we going to restrict? Well, it depends on the theory. Quickly, let's take a look at the difference between axiomatic and semantic versions of these theories of truth. So there are two ways we can look at a particular theory of truth. We can look at it axiomatically in terms of the axioms we use, basically defining truth solely through a set of axioms, or semantically by explaining what truth means. In this video, we will be looking at the axiomatic version of this theory of truth. Now, Kripke offered a semantic theory of truth for which Pfefferman provided an axiomatic schema. Since this theory is not typed, we need some other restriction on our notation of truth to avoid the liar's paradox. The Kripke-Pfefferman theory will not include an axiom which allows us to pull negation out of the scope of truth or to put it in. This means that while our base logic remains classical, our logic under the scope of tr the truth predicate will be non-classical, since we will not be able to derive the law of the excluded middle or the law of the non-contradiction. In this video, first, we will look at the implications of excluding this axiom, and then the other axioms used in place of it. Basically, what we're saying here is that we are not explicitly stating that you can take negation out from under the truth claim or put it in. So, just because it's true that it's not the case that A, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not the case that it's true that A. And this is going to help us resolve the liar's paradox in a way we'll look at in a moment. To be clear, Kripke is not advocating a non-classical logic. Our base logic is still classical. There are no statements that are both 
true and false. Under this theory, we cannot deduce, it's not the case that it's true that A and it's true that A, which the law of non-contradiction would explicitly forbid. Nor can we prove, it's not the case that it's true that A or it's not true that A, which the law of the excluded middle would explicitly forbid. We can, however, prove that it's true that A is materially equivalent to it's true that not A. Note that in this one, the negation is within the scope of the truth predicate, which is why this logic doesn't have the problem of being non-classical, at least outside of the truth predicate, just so long as A is the liar sentence. And we'll look at how to do this in a moment. This means that either the liar sentence and its negation are both true, or neither is. This may seem to violate the law of the excluded middle or the law of non-contradiction, but it only means that under the scope of the truth predicate, they do not apply. The law of the excluded middle and the law of non-contradiction do not say anything about what happens under the scope of the truth predicate or really any other predicate. And by defining it axiomatically, we can exclude the law of the excluded middle and the law of non-contradiction from our definition. So we can have contradictions under the truth predicate, and those contradictions will not wander outside of the truth predicate, as the liar sentence might lead us to think. So if this doesn't make sense, imagine we have another predicate, which is GNA, where GN could be semantically formulated as is a girdle number. Certainly, if we have axioms which correctly describe this predicate, we should be able to deduce GNA is materially equivalent to GN not A, since A is a girdle number if and only if the arithmetization of negation in front of A is. This does not violate the law of the excluded middle or the law of non-contradiction. It's not even in any way controversial, really. And since we're taking truth as simply a predicate which we are defining in terms of axioms, so long as that statement doesn't lead us to a direct contradiction with one of our other axioms, and remember that's a contradiction outside of the truth predicate, that won't either. But it will mean that under the scope of the truth predicate, the law of the excluded middle and the law of non-contradiction will not apply. In the next video, we'll go into greater depth about the semantics or the meaning of such a truth concept. But in this video, let's get out the axioms that specifically define it. So, in order to accommodate the exclusion of the negation axiom from our set of axioms, we will need to add some more axioms. All of the axioms from TPA will be included. Check out the previous videos if you're not sure what I'm talking about there. In addition to these other axioms, of those six axioms that we added to TPA for our typed theory of truth, we're going to maintain three. The original statement about truth conditions for atomic sentences, basically saying that an atomic sentence is going to be the case, implies that it's true that that atomic sentence is materially equivalent to it's true zero that that atomic sentence. If you're confused by that, check out the video on axiomatic typed theories of truth. It's explained in much better detail there. And we're also going to include two statements regarding bringing quantification into or out of the truth predicate. Once again, check out the video on axiomatic typed theories of truth for more on these axioms. Basically, KF2 and KF3 are just saying that we can bring all for all, or there exists an X, into or out of our, the scope of our truth predicate. Since we lack the negation axiom, we will need to add three more axioms related to these axioms to define how negation works in these situations. Basically, since we don't have a general rule about negation, we need to offer specific versions of that rule which will not lead to the liar's paradox, but will do the work of that general rule in specific cases. The first axiom allows us to take negation out of or put it into the scope of a truth predicate over an atomic sentence. Remember, atomic sentences don't have the truth predicate in them. The other two will allow us to 
pull a quantifier through a negation and out of the scope of a truth predicate as we would normally do with our change of quantifier rule. So remember how if you have, it's not the case that for all x something, you can bring that negation in and change it to there exists an x such that it's not the case. That's basically what we're saying with 5 and 6. We're explicitly explaining how you can do change of quantifier by bringing that existential or universal quantifier out of the truth predicate and through a negation. Now we'll look at axioms related to conjunction and disjunction. These first two are similar to the ones that were part of our type theory of truth. However, they are less restrictive because they do not require that our girdle number be only of the type that truth, the truth predicate can apply to, since now our truth predicates can range over themselves. We don't have to arbitrarily exclude sentences with the same truth predicate. Basically, we've gotten rid of the STPAA condition at the beginning. Otherwise, they simply define disjunction and conjunction under the scope of the truth predicate. So we can basically pull apart a disjunction or pull apart a conjunction or put together a conjunction or put together a disjunction into or out of the truth predicate. However, since we do not have our negation axiom, we'll need to explicitly define what might otherwise be called the Morgan's Law, or how negation operates under a truth predicate. These two axioms allow us to not only bring negation into a disjunction and a conjunction, but also to split a negated conjunction or disjunction. We could have proven similar rules before, but without the negation axiom, we need to state these rules explicitly. So, if you are aware of de Morgan's law, which you probably are if you're at this point in logic, we're saying that we can bring that negation into a disjunction, split it up, and make it a conjunction, or we can bring negation into a conjunction, split it up, and make it a disjunction, and we can do the opposite. We're stating these rules explicitly because we can't bring negation into and out of our truth predicate, so we couldn't prove them. Now, before we cover the last two axioms, which are what really sets this system apart from other systems, we need to offer a version of double negation, which works under the truth predicate. This should be fairly straightforward because this is just basically stating our double negation rule. It's saying that truth predicating over neg double negation of a statement and truth predication over that statement is materially equivalent. Since we don't have the axiom which allows us to pull negation out, we need to deal with double negations under the scope of truth predicates. And the final two axioms are what really makes this a type-free theory of truth. They are the iteration axiom and its negation. So while we haven't explicitly excluded the rule that you might predicate, you can't predicate truth over itself. We haven't explicitly included it either, and that's what the iteration axiom is going to do. Basically, they state that if and only if it is true that some statement is true, then that statement is true. And if and only if it is true that it is not the case that some statement is true, then it is true that statement is not the case. In other words, truth can apply to itself, something that was strictly prohibited in typed theories of truth. And basically, what 12 is saying is that when you have two levels of truth over a particular statement, you can reduce that to one, which means that you can reduce any number of levels of truth down to one, and that if you have just one level of truth over a statement, you can iterate that. You can have, it's true that it's true that A, it's true that it's true that it's true that A, which seems very intuitive, but was actually a big problem for typed theories of truth. You would have to be talking about different predicates every single time you said it's true that it's true that it's true that it's true, and so on and so forth. And once again, because we always have to define negation very explicitly with this theory, KF13 is going to say that it's true that it's not the case that it's true that A, we still can't pull that negation outside of our truth, but what we can do is we can compress that it's true that it's A down to simply A to 
be left with it's true that not a. Or conversely, we can expand it's true that not a out to it's true that it's not the case that it's true that a. Once again, noting we can't pull the negation outside of the truth, but we can with in that truth context, add another truth onto A, keeping the negation where it is, just one level from being outside of the truth claim. So, if you want, here are all of the axioms that we just covered. Take a look. Hopefully, you have some understanding of them. Like I said, the previous videos in this series will explain my particular notation here, but Hopefully you have a good sense of what these different axioms mean. Now, we said that this can resolve the liar paradox. How? Well, using these axioms, when we try to derive the liar's paradox, what we end up with is not a contradiction, but a very, very strange statement, which is similar to the liar's paradox, but since the law of the excluded middle and the law of non-contradiction do not apply under the scope of the truth predicate, it is not technically a contradiction. It states that it's true that A is materially equivalent to it's true that not A, which seems quite counterintuitive, where A is the arithmetization of the liar sentence. But when you think about the counterintuitiveness of the liar sentence, it might make some sense. So here's an informal proof of it. Assume A is the girdle number for, it's not the case that it's true that A. We can instantiate it in KF12 for all A, TA, TTA is materially equivalent to TA. We get that it's true that it's true that it's not the case that it's true that A is materially equivalent to, it's true that it's not the case that it's true that A. Because we said it's not the case that it's true that A is the same as A, in those square brackets, remember, that's just saying we're taking that number. So we can then, using the law of identity, replace it in the first instance just with A, giving us it's true that it's true that A is materially equivalent to it's true that it's not the case that it's true that A. Now using KF12 and KF13, we can reduce this down to it's true that A is materially equivalent to it's true that not A. Remembering that those let us kind of knock off the extra true in the front of the first half of that statement and reduce the second statement down, keeping the negation inside the scope of the truth predicate. This seems like a counterintuitive statement, but when compared to the statement that we got with the original liar paradox, which was actually contradictory and against the very axioms of our system, this statement at least is consistent. So that was the Kripke-Pfefferman axiomatic type-free theory of truth. Next up, we're going to be kind of looking at some of the semantics, some of the meaning behind this theory of truth, and maybe offering some objections to it as well. After that, we'll be looking at the Friedman sheared axiomatic type free theory of truth, and then finally, a kind of semantic version of that axiomatic theory known as revisionist theories of truth. After those three videos, we only have one more left in this amazingly long, long series. Watch this video and more here at carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.